Alright, so we dive in today. We're talking about revolution. Bring it up. That's all right. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson once said, uh, the revolution now and then can be a good thing. Okay, and certainly these two revolutions discussing today uh, certainly transformed the world. Uh, the American Revolution, get, uh, kick off with the Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Yorktown, Treaty of Paris, 1783, with the aftermath of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And see how it led into the French Revolution, uh, which have consequences all across Europe, uh, and basically embroil uh, American foreign policy for the first 25 years of uh, this nation's existence. From the uh, life and reign and death of Louis XIV, the Assembly of Notables, the Estates General, the National Assembly, the Bastille, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the Legislative Assembly, the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, the National Convention, the Reign of Terror, and Maximilian Robespierre. Okay, where did you get started with that? Now, one thing you have to understand about th these uh, revolutions is they're very different. They have very different results. Uh, the American Revolution seems to have a very seems to be very orderly compared to the. Uh, chaos of the French Revolution. You have simply the process of one government overthrowing another after another after another. Uh, where most of the fighting in the American Revolution is confined simply to the United States, the French Revolution is going to end up pulling in all of Europe. And then all this talk we have a in all these ideas. Sorry. They're going to have a, probably find a political expression here in the French Revolution and the American Revolution. The success of the American Revolution is going to spur uh, moment, the momentum for the French Revolution. It's hard to underestimate the impact of both. Um, look at page 577 of the book. See this famous painting of uh, signing the Declaration of Independence. So the five uh, main authors of it, uh, led by Thomas Jefferson, uh, presenting their work. Uh, now, the Declaration of Independence of the United States, so it has no legal power, but it is the ideological heart of the American Revolution. It is a question, what was the war about? What were the Americans fighting for? Basically, a government of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Basically, a government that would respect the rights of the people. The government must acknowledge that the rights of people do exist, and the government has a responsibility to protect them. That should help uh, guide the. Uh, Um, the Declaration of Independence, some of the ideas will guide the creation of the Constitution of the national government afterward, but the Declaration itself was not a law in the United States. It's simply a, a series of goals the Americans were fighting for. And the United States, the country, was deeply divided. In many areas, it was a civil war. You had a lot of loyalist uh, American colonists fighting on the British side. Uh, it says a very hard fought, long, bitter war. The Americans faced a lot of shortages, faced a lot of defeats and losses. But over time, the Americans kept fighting. And by General Washington, kept an army in the field every year of the war. Just kept after the British every year, slowly wearing them down, wearing down their will to fight. Now, the Declaration of Independence, it would also have a tremendous impact, uh, not just on the United States and on social movements in the future. In fact, you have several social movements among the women's rights movement and the abolitionist movement. They'll, uh, uh, they often refer to the Declaration of Independence and their founding, but other nations as well. A lot of colonial nations uh, fighting for independence for uh, from this point forward, they would often cite the American Declaration of Independence and their cause for their own independence. 
uh, is it countries such as uh, Vietnam, their Declaration of Independence is very closely uh, framed on the American Declaration of Independence. Now, the Americans in the Revolutionary War facing a lot of defeats. Uh, they've uh, several points in the war in which the American, the Continental Army almost completely disintegrates. Uh, Americans facing shortages of everything. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of ammunition. Uh, they have fighting spirit, but that only gets you so far. But as soon as the American Revolution starts, French agents come to the United States encouraging delegates of the Continental Congress, which basically started assuming the shape of the nat started basically becoming acting as the national government. The, uh, these French agents basically encouraging the Americans to keep on agitating against the British and to keep fighting. And by early 1776, the French were actually sending ammunition is actually sending gunpowder to the colonies to fight against the British. Back in the first years of the American Revolution, most of the gunpowder used by the Continental Army was from France. Did they have any neutral benefits as far as what French would be out of it? Um, Initially, not a lot. Basically, the French are mostly interested at this point is basically, can they really stick it to the British? Yeah. Basically, if they can have the Americas, then uh, it's not the British art either. <laughs> They're boiling it down to spare basis. Like I said, they're wanting to make more money off this, but basically, they're giving away money too, if that means the difference between British victory and British defeat. Yeah. I've heard the revolution get called a proxy war. Because it was very much an indirect war between France, France, Spain, and against the British Empire. In a lot of ways it was, especially in the early stages, but the, the latter phase of the war, especially as France and Spain came more involved, uh, they were actually very deeply involved in the fighting. Um, uh, in fact, I will uh, elaborate on that story as we move on here. The uh, French... Uh, Government is actually pushing for most of this gunpowder to be sent to the to the Continental Army, but of course France doesn't yet want a war with Britain, so but they're having to send this ammunition through third parties, so basically kind of keep their hand, their name and their uh, fingerprints off of it all. Basically, plausible deniability. Because France, they want to see the United States win. They'd like to see the United States independent, but they don't want to back a bad horse. They don't want to be involved in a conflict where they have to do all the fighting. <laughs> so, again, the proxy question. Then comes this man, Ben Franklin. Franklin was a noted diplomat, a, a politician in the, the colonies, well-known scientist, uh, he actually was considered one of the world's foremost experts in electricity since a, a famed kite flying experiment. Flying, uh, flying a kite in uh, a thunderstorm was uh, basically to prove that lightning was electricity. Probably not the smartest thing he ever did, but it was a pretty exciting point. So a lot of people get electrocuted doing that thing. But, uh, but a very clever man, very clever scientist. He invented bifocal glasses, among other things. Just, just a tinker, man. Just Man with a insatiable thirst for knowledge and for solving problems. Very famous for that. So, so he, <laughs> so he pretty much probably be a billionaire than today. Yeah, he would be. Uh, the lightning rod, he invented that as uh, a means to try to uh, keep homes from catching on fire and being damaged from a lightning strike. So he actually gave that away for free. So it was such an important benefit for the public. He just that make sure everybody, as many people had one as possible, he comes from being burned down by lightning. So he'd be doing very pretty well today. Actually, yes, he was a flirt. Um, he was happily married, but didn't uh, stop him from uh, uh, flirting with the ladies. 
the last royal governor of New Jersey actually was his illegitimate son. Like I said, they had a very deep, uh, bitter split over uh, their politics. Uh, basically, uh, Franklin said uh, in his will that he was going to leave nothing to uh, his son because said his politics during the war would have left him with nothing anyway. But that kind of a rough family life. Anyways, Franklin, um, he was the uh, colonial agent of the British Parliament the years before the war. Basically, he was their lobbyist, trying to uh, speak to members of Parliament about uh, issues regarding the colonies, but can never find anybody or enough people willing to listen. There were a few interested, a few sympathetic, but just couldn't get enough uh, people interested. So, Franklin is sent by the Continental Congress after the Declaration of Independence is signed to France to try to achieve recognition for the United States and, more importantly, an alliance with France. So he's able to meet with a few people here and there uh, in the French government, but uh, they aren't willing to speak to them much on the record. So what he does is he starts talking to their wives. <laughs> basically, these uh, parlors where uh, women would meet, gather, basically play cards, have brunch, and talk politics and philosophy. Franklin's a popular guest here, and they're fascinated by him. So America's this way off frontier land, a uh, very strange place, and they're completely fascinated by him. And Franklin's slowly charmed. <coughs> and slowly is uh, gaining some inroads in the French government. Like see, Louis the Sixteenth, the King of France, at this point, isn't quite sure about this whole revolution thing. Doesn't like the idea of uh, uh, people rebelling against their king. It's a little close to home. But uh, Mark Kipton said, "We can't let the British have have the Americas." So it's always going along with it. But uh, more importantly, what the French are telling Franklin is they need to see a big victory by the Americans to prove that they can carry their own weight in the war. 1777, they get that. Battle of Saratoga in upstate New York. Americans overwhelm and overpower British force, force an army of 5,000 British redcoats to surrender. So one of the worst losses by the British in the war. A huge victory. Americans won little victories before. This is a huge one. They completely disrupted British plans of uh, splitting, the, uh, of uh, retaking the colonies. And um, next day, when news re this uh, October victory reaches France in December, there's dancing in the streets in Paris. Uh, the one of their own armies have won over the British. Now the British are want, the French are wanting to talk. And so by February 1778, France does two things. One, recognizes the U.S. independence. So France is the first country to recognize American independence. And so it offers a regular trade treaty with the United States, basically. We can trade for, uh, with France. That's important for our commerce. And second, the Treaty of Alliance. The Treaty of Alliance basically says that the United States and France are now allies, and they would go to each other's uh, aid in time of war. Basically, if France goes to war with somebody, the United States goes to war with whoever France is at war with. But the United States is at war, therefore France must come in on their side of the war. Until when? Huh? Until when? Is uh, that like forever and ever and ever and ever? Initially, it was basically until the treaties canceled, but uh, the treaty was canceled by the mid-1790s because of the French Revolution. France basically ended up declaring war on all the monarchies in Europe. The United States says... Uh, that's not what we signed up for. So you don't think that was their agenda by helping the United States to weaken the... Yeah, they want to weaken Britain. But remember, France is still a monarchy. 
France is still a autocratic monarchy. The revolution is still years away. Okay. But so uh, basically, this is based for France. Basically, this is revenge against England. That's what it's about. Okay. They want to knock them down a few notches. And so, by uh, summer 1778, French and British ships are firing on each other in the Atlantic, and uh, they're at war. France actually uh, supplies several troops. They land some troops in some areas that end up liberating some American coastal towns from uh, the British. And most importantly, the Battle of Yorktown. Now, of course, remember, France is important, very powerful, well-established nation. So... Well, you have the U.S. and the U.K. already fighting each other. You have France into the mix by 1778 openly. It means you now have the French Navy and the French Army fighting against the British, in addition to whatever money and ammunition the French can send to the United States. Right, the United States is not a power strong nation. It's got a lot of potential, but not able to capitalize on it yet. It's a very weak power, very weak nation. Well, France pulls in its ally, Spain, in by 1779. Very close ally. Uh, basically sweetened the pot of a, the idea of revenge against England. And so Spain gets in on the act. In fact, Spain does have some important uh, roles to play in the French and the American Revolution. Uh, Bernardo de Galvez, the governor of Spain, actually unleashes the Spanish Navy in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico against the British, which basically keeps the British from uh, uh, British Navy from supporting their armies in the field and keeps them from uh, supplying, uh, uh, resupplying their troops on land in North America. It's basically enough of a distraction helps uh, make the difference. In 1780, Holland. Holland had also recognized the United States. They were neutral in this war, but they were uh, making a nice, steady little profit trading with the United States uh, while the war was going on. Britain objected to this because they had a blockade up against the colonies and ended up declaring war on Holland. So by 1780, you got five countries fighting for American independence. Well, uh, the war in the northern colonies ends up uh, boiling down into a stalemate. Basically, the U.S. has uh, British forces bottled up in New York City, which was occupied throughout the war, but New England and the middle colonies basically were largely free of uh, the British by the 1780, but the British are trying to take control, hold control of the South. It is the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, which they'd won during the French and Indian War because of the agricultural products that they have provided. Right, that's a, the cash cow colonies was the South because of all the agricultural products. Right, the pine tar, North Carolina. Uh, remember, that's being used to coat the holes of British ships. Right. Wooden ships so they don't, uh, the wood isn't brought away so easily so the worms aren't eating away so strengthens the integrity of the hulls on ships so they can last longer. It's a huge benefit for the British uh, merchant marine and the British Navy. Big business in those days. This is years before their metal hulled ships, so that's still important. Tobacco, hugely important for the British economy. Rice grown in South Carolina, hugely important for the British economy. Important source of food for the people, particularly for their military. So as long as they got all those products from the South coming in, the British thing, they can at least hold on to the South and they can at least break even in the war. And the British are having some success in the southern phase of the war, 1779-1780, but uh, 1781, things start turning around a little bit, uh, particularly uh, the Battle of the Virginia Case in May of 1781. The uh, British and the French are fighting in uh, Chesapeake Bay, Uh, French defeat the British Navy, giving the uh, French and the Americans, by extension, control of the waters in and around Virginia. Continental armies flooding uh, Virginia and North Carolina with reinforcements. 
basically trying to stem the tide of the British pushing further north. And finally, they made the Battle of Yorktown here in the latter part of 1781. Battle of Yorktown is one of the few battles in which the Americans actually outnumbered the British. They had the uh, uh, French Army forces there, uh, French Navy, as well as Washington and the Continental forces. They fought that for two weeks, and the British ha at the end have no choice but to surrender. How did they just, I don't know, remember. didn't have enough people, or they didn't know they were bringing up any people here? Yeah, uh, the uh, British had a pretty good force with them, just basically the, the American French force basically kind of took them by surprise, and uh, most other battles, just the Americans just didn't have enough manpower to uh, send down to face the British. And this kind of part of the problem was, uh, so they had a lot of fighting spirit, just not a lot enough men and not enough ammunition a lot of times. Sometimes that beat the few numbers they had was enough to win a victory, but sometimes it's enough to wear the British down as they fight them to a stalemate. Remember Washington's strategy in the American Revolution. Win by not losing. It's a strategy that works. <laughs> It didn't have to be pretty. All you have to do is win. All you have to do is be standing at the end. That's Washington's strategy. <laughs> yeah. And he still was. Except he was, um, he defeated the British. Uh, he was, uh, even those battles he lost, he had enough of his army intact and himself intact. They could uh, pull back, uh, regroup, and fight again another day. Because Washington knew one thing, though, and just as Ben Franklin said when he signed the Declaration of Independence, said, we must either hang together or we should be hung separately. Wow. If they lose, it's treason, and they're going to the gallows. So they're going to die regardless. Yes, it, it, either in battle or if they... Die in battle or I die at, uh, yeah. in the gallows, but uh, so they're going to die trying. Except they prefer not to die, but... Uh, so there wasn't no way they wouldn't die. Okay. Next yeah. Well, eventually everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> like getting hung, like the hanging. Like. Yeah, um, if they were caught at the end of the war, uh, um, like say in the British one, they would have been hung for treason. After two weeks fighting, after the Valley uh, North Town, after a year, this after six years of fighting. So they, the British Prime Minister Lord North realized after a Saratoga that there's no way they could win the fight. So they started negotiating with the United States. And so the United States laid down the terms that uh, either withdraw all your troops from North America or recognize American dependence. Lord North said, uh, uh, the king, he had the king's confidence, and there was some criticism in the parliament, but uh, basically, 1782, he resigns as prime minister, not because he's it's like accused of the loss, but just because it's a matter of honor. He's humiliated by it. The uh, best British, rest of minds, the British military, basically, they were uh, uh, dumbfounded by it. Said, How did the colonies win? The British now, there were several others, but first they such a humiliating defeat. Um, except, I remember the strange thing about European politics is, from the American perspective, the British really weren't the bad guys. The British really did some really nasty things in the colonies, but... In terms of the continental politics, the British actually are kind of the good guys. They're actually the more open, more liberal of the uh, governments in uh, Europe. One of the freest nations in, in Europe at that time. Even at this time period? Even this time period. By the standards of 1780, Britain's one of the freest nations on Earth. And that's one of the things that the Americans were fighting for was they expected certain rights of English subjects. Rights that the British system guaranteed that you didn't find in a lot of other countries like due process of law, like trial by jury, 
um, things that did not exist in, say, France or Spain or some places like that. So, Sorry, Nigeria don't exist? Except in the colonies it did, but as the vice admiralty courts, where they're charging those tax, those tax enforcement, they didn't have it, those vice admiralty courts. They say, hey, you took that away from us. Uh, so basically, the British made a series of horribly, horrible miscalculations that uh, alienated the colonies. Now, they're desperate for money, and they basically end up trying to gouge the colonists mm -hmm. and stepping on their rights, and the colonists objected by declaring war on them. So it all comes down to money, as far as why the war started. Yeah. My theory on Basically, oh, it is a... <laughs> there is an economic reason for the start of the American Revolution. Oh, we still move. <coughs> yeah. Follow the money, like the man said. <laughs> but um, Washington led the troops to victory, uh, thrilling victory for the United States. But of course, they have the problems afterward of. How are they going to pay the bills? <laughs> they owe a lot of money to a lot of people, and they don't have any means of raising a lot of money. Right. The government they had in place under the Arctic Federation, the first national constitution, was very weak. They didn't even have any provisions for the federal government to even collect taxes, basically whatever the states are willing to give to the national government. And they had the states had their own bills to pay, and they aren't giving the, the national government anything. So eventually, the war ends here at the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Now, know the difference between the Treaty of 1763 and 83. Different treaties, different terms, and in very different wars. Well, this treaty does, it ends the American Revolution. Ben Franklin was actually in charge of the negotiations for the uh, United States. Um, Britain recognizes U.S. independence. But the border at the Mississippi River is greatly expanding the colonial claims. Franklin had tried to get uh, Canada to be added to the United States, but uh, France and Spain weren't willing to uh, back the American claim, basically. Uh, they wanted an uh, independent United States with the, uh, want to be somewhat powerful and grow, but not too powerful. They don't want them to have everything. And you can see the territory results here on page 576, uh, between 1763 and 1783 in the map insets. Uh, U.S. will cede, Britain will cede Florida back to Spain. Britain will hold Gibraltar, other colonies. Uh, uh, Yes, we'll recognize uh, private debts against the British. Then as some storekeeper, somebody owes some money to a British company, that debt is not canceled. The U.S. also gets uh, fishing rights off of Canada. That's important for the American economy in the Northeast. Uh, kind of think of fishing uh, being a big business, especially if you're in landlocked Arkansas. But uh, areas like Massachusetts, Maine, that is, that's their livelihood, sir. So, why fish? Okay, just an economic Yeah, economics, food, plus the fact it helps helps establish America and. Uh, uh, shipping in American commerce. I mean, why not probably the answer there yet, or why yeah. fish? Yeah. Well, fish. So, because, uh, one thing, it's a food supply, it's a big business here on the coast. So we don't think about it so much here in Arkansas because we're so far away from the ocean. Then they do whaling and all that type of stuff. Yeah, whaling's a big right. business, getting only bigger after that. Right. So, right. They used all that for different oils and all that stuff. Yeah, it's like so. But well, go to southern Louisiana, basically, if, as poor as the people living in the bayou always were, they always had food because there was always something in the bayou. Um, oh, yeah. Always fishing a big seafood area in New Orleans, because it's right there. Everybody eats seafood, but uh, 
up here, we really don't eat so much. If we do, it's not salt water fish, it's fresh water fish. Uh, the, except, except the best seafood in town is a minute. It, it's the fried fish at the Sitco station. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. No, I'm not I'm about the Springdale thing. Shrimp is exotic seafood. <laughs> he's a mob like what? He's a good man, but how much shrimp do they have in Springdale, Arkansas? Not a lot. <laughs> but this little thing is going to help the American economy grow and help American shipping up in that part of the world. The little things are going to start all adding together. So, Treaty Paris. So, America's off to a good start. But it needs a stronger constitution which was created by 1787. Instead of just being just one, uh, one House Congress, it's the three branch government the presidency, established in its constitution, two House uh, uh, National Legislature, House Representatives, and the Senate, and Supreme Court, which the President uh, would appoint Supreme Court members and uh, with the advice and consent of the Senate. And there wasn't provision you could, uh, that, uh, yes, even in election years, the President still gets to appoint uh, Supreme Court justices. That here come a question after uh, Justice Scalia died. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It says, as long as the President's in office, the President can appoint judges with the advice and consent of the Senate. But uh, what it ended up doing, though, was creating a system of checks and balances in the United States. The United States would be a republic. Uh, certain rights spelled out, certain limitations on the power of the government be spelled out. But overall, it would be a system designed to uh, protect the rights of the people, where the voice of the people would be heard. People elect their representatives. Uh, the checks and balances were not one branch be more powerful than the other. Each one had some check on the power of the other in some way. Accent is the Constitution that has uh, been in use ever since. In fact, the United States Constitution today, it is the oldest Constitution still in use anywhere in the world. In fact, it's the only handwritten Constitution in use anywhere in the world. If it hired somebody to ride out and it is. We the people. But uh, a lot of Americans weren't quite convinced there was enough uh, checks on the limitations of power of the, uh, of the federal government and convinced there weren't enough rights of the people spelled out in the Constitution. It's have to remember that basic uh, principle of law is the law is about what the law says. About what it doesn't say or what isn't there, it's what the law says. And it was not explicitly written down, you taken advantage of it. Which leads us to the creation of the Bill of Rights. It's initially uh, crafted as a, a conciliatory gesture to those who were opposed to the ratification of the Constitution at first, but actually became a cornerstone of the civil liberties of the American people since then. As ratified in 1791. Among other things, guaranteeing freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, due process of law, right to have an attorney in a criminal case, um, right to speedy uh, in a public trial, right to a jury trial of your peers, no cruel and unusual punishments, among many other provisions. Basically, this statement of American civil liberties here, the Bill of Rights, would also have a tremendous impact on uh, the development of civil liberties across the entire world. It was a great inspiration for the development of uh, developing countries, developing republics everywhere, including France and Europe. Where one step builds on another, it builds on the next. Now, Americans got a lot out of it. They're having some tough times afterward, a long post-war depression, uh, trying to pay these bills, but some very impressive achievements in uh, law and civil rights. But for France, though, basically they're stuck with a the hangover afterward. 
France was deeply in debt after the, after the French and Indian War. Remember how bad off Frank England was that it had to basically pass these tax laws after the French and Indian War to try to pay its debts after the war to the point that it alienated its colonists. France's financial situation was just as bad. But they didn't have these colonies to draw on. And now they just fought the American Revolution too. Very expensive war. Now how are they going to pay all this off? Question is, problem is, they can't. They're broke. Broke is a joke. Yeah. So is uh, you know how the United States has like 19 trillion right now? Is yeah. that all like worked up, or is that just like? I mean, I know it's true, but is it as bad as they say, or is it a bunch of it's, propaganda type stuff? It's not really as bad as it seems. You got to say with debt, it's a uh, Debt in comparison to the gross national product of the country. What are the value of goods and services of the economy? Like I said, the United States has had much worse debt problems before. Uh, like I say, a lot of other countries have had much worse debt problems because, yeah, I suppose, yeah, some country owes, say, just a trillion dollars, but. They only make so much. Yeah, they only have, like, say, a $30 billion economy. They'll never pay it off, they're bankrupt. The United States, we have like a $20, $25 trillion economy. Our national debt is $19 trillion. We can pay that off. It'll take a while, but we can do we can, it. We can afford it. Yeah, we can afford it. Basically, it's like your credit limit or your credit rating. It's the same principle. But is America paying it off? Or is it we are. A little at a time. Uh, the thing is, though, 2001... Bill Clinton left office, we had a huge budget surplus. We were using it to pay down the national debt even more rapidly than we had before. That's before then, we're just have, we had a big deficit base where we're just paying the interest on it. Basically, paying the minimum balance on your credit card. Basically. So you're still paying it down, so it's going to take a lot longer to do. <laughs> but, uh, but, 2001 afterward, all of a sudden you have these huge deficits because the president at the time, George W. Bush, decided, okay, let's cut taxes down to, uh, down to the bone and uh, let's start spending a lot more on uh, the military and a bunch of other projects and we're going to have a couple wars we're not going to pay for. Let's put on a credit card. So what happens by 2008, we have trillion dollar deficits. Well, how are you going to get rid of a trillion dollar deficit? Especially when you're in 2008, 2009, entering a depression. Can't raise taxes because no one has any money in 2008, 2009. You have to start growing the economy, hoping those tax receipts start uh, covering everything, start cutting back a little here and there. Because if you suddenly started, this said, okay, we're just not going to pay that extra trillion dollars. We're going to cut everything down the bone, basically. You're going to destroy the economy. What happens all of a sudden? You take a trillion dollars of spending out of the economy. Those guys. So it's been coming down with the time. The top, the this is now under like three hundred odd billion dollars, down seventy percent from its peak. It's coming down a little at a time. Very historically, that's a very rapid drop in the deficit, but it's still there. Basically, we're still having to borrow money to pay basic bills, but. Uh, if, say, we just stop spending the next $300 billion, what happened to the economy? Take $300 billion spending out of the economy all of a sudden. Who's that, like, who's that money owed to? Like, random like, countries? Or is it like Mostly to ourselves. It's ourselves? Uh, yeah, well, uh, pretty much. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we borrow from uh, trust funds, like the Social Security Trust Fund, Native American Reservations, uh, banks, uh, savings bonds. That's basically... Yep. Uh, part of the deficit that, that there. Basically, uh, you buy a $50 savings bond, the government pays back $100. That $50 you're sending in, that's the government used to operate, but it's still owes you $100 bucks, 20 years down the line. So it's basically us. He's us. Yeah, that's the overall majority of it. There's some here and there we owe to foreign countries, but not very, comparatively not very much. So why does it, so why does that other money count if it's just paying our growth back? 
Well, it's basically, it's, a, it's like taking from your food budget to pay your mortgage, pay the rent. They call that robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Basically, yeah. mm -hmm. people need their Social Security checks, so they need their money at some point. That's how that's to be paid off. That's, um, you know, I suppose uh, you borrow money from your aunt or from your wife. Um, okay, you uh, still got the basic problem. You still, owe, uh, you still owe money. It may not be as immediate. You have to pay it back because, okay, the missus is going to be too upset about you. Uh, who knows where that uh, money is, but uh, has to be coming back eventually somehow. But, uh, it's still, she's worth 20 bucks. Something like that. I was thinking we would see like the old 400 years. We do owe some money to China and Japan. Well, it's like the whole... But not the whole thing is about China and Japan. So how do they actually borrow it from, from us? Like, take our taxes out of our shit, you daddy? Or? Uh, basically, half... Uh, now they owe to private, like private banks and everything. Basically, they have people from the government go down and ask for loans from the banks, and uh, like I say they sign the papers of the government, the Treasury Department. They get their free toaster for the loan and go on. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. But uh, how's it borrowed from us? Basically, yeah, right. um, like I say, all that money paying to Social Security, like. Yeah. Like my work yeah, it's sitting, yeah, it's sitting in a big old pot there in Washington. Basically, they just taken as much money from that pot as they could, but uh, oh. they have to put it back so they can actually pay all the checks that the government owes to them. That's why I keep saying Social Security is going to be gone because they keep taking money from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a problem, but, uh, it's a, but it's a manageable problem, something the government can fix. Mm -hmm. so Social Security isn't about to go bankrupt. It's basically... It's it doesn't matter figuring out how we can pay those bills back. Right. Like, say, even if, say, Social Security is completely insolvent, uh, it would still be paying you 75 cents on the dollar what it owes you. You'd still be getting something out of it, just not as much. That's a question of, you want that whole thing you're owed. Yeah, because it probably ain't yeah, yeah. that much anyway. Except, but, uh, and you retire, you're 80 years old, it's... It's a, it's going to help out a little. That little bit's going to help out. Make sure you be able to keep your home or not. Or yeah, I mean that nine-year-old woman at Walmart has to push the uh, play the shopping carts outside. But uh, back to France, they all owe us money, and they're trying everything they can to figure out how to pay it back. But can't figure out because play the sixteen. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's there basically because he inherited it. He's not too bright. Not really interested in the affairs of the French government. They're all telling him, we've got all these bills to pay. We can't pay him back. Yeah. So he sends this uh, one new guy in to audit the federal government, Jacques Necker, and uh, uh, he basically uh, proposes this huge austerity program. Basically, the government cutting back on everything, but still it's not enough. Okay, see, the whole French government, whole French economy, whole French financial system is still geared, oriented towards a medieval system. They got modern 18th century problems, but they're, they have a financial system like it's still the 14th century. Big problem. They have not modernized. They have not kept up with the times. That's all because of who? Yeah, because basically, the upper classes, they've had to change. They're still getting their money. They're still benefiting from this thing. So they did, right? Maybe this hand out here, a French Revolution. Front and back, very important to read it. Um, here. Now you study this for the exam, you have to study this for the exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But wait, there's more. There's more. If you call now. <laughs> yeah. So, 1786. French government burdened by debts, crude by mismanagement, 
war, particularly the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, is in danger of insolvency. They're about to lose absolutely everything. So if France doesn't pay back its debts, it becomes a basket case overnight. <laughs> so it'll never be a great deal. Yeah. And so here's the problem thing. The traditional French tax making body, advisory body of the king, something called the Estates General. It was made up of the three classes of the French society as it existed in the 14th century. And these three classes were called the estates. They included the nobility, clergy, that is Roman and Catholic clergy. This is an officially Roman Catholic country. So the priests, the bishops, the cardinals, they have their own. The nobility, the titled nobles, the extended, royal, the extended uh, members of the royal family. Yeah. And then everybody else. They have heard the term fourth estate before. It actually comes from the French Revolution, the first of the media. Independent newspapers uh, put out at this time, which are um, heavily editorializing ideas about how the government should be run, how the revolution should be run, essentially becomes a branch of the government in and of itself. Uh, so if we get the term fourth estate from the media. But here's the thing. Um, the Estates General had not met since 1614. Remember, France is an autocratic country, absolute power by the monarch. They do not want to be told what to do by anybody. Certainly not the Estates General. The Estates General, of course, it's three, they vote as their own individual classes, but usually it's the nobility and the clergy outvoting the peasants. It's not based on population. It's based on status, yeah, social class. But uh, everyone's telling Louis the Louis the Sixteenth that the problems of the French government, the French uh, the French financial system, are too big for the king to handle by himself. He needs advice. He needs to call in people. He has to call in the Estates General. He needs their help to reorganize the French government for the French financial system. This is, the problems are just too big, too complicated for one man to settle himself. Well, Louis tries to avoid that. 1787, he had calls in something called the Assembly of Notables. Basically, calls in basically an election for a small body of uh, the nobility, that is the upper classes, the pile of nobles and so forth, to meet with them to discuss these issues of the French government, the French financial system. Assembly of Notables. Basically trying to bypass the Estates General. This, of course, hasn't been called in over nearly 200 years at this point, 175 years. But the nobles here say the same thing everyone else is saying. You have to call in the Estates General. France is at brink. We have to change. We have to update the system. This has to be a matter for the Estates General. Of course, with 16th Spears, that if he calls them in, mm -hmm. everything's on the table. Everything's can. Uh, who knows how this could go, how this could spiral out of control. What's going to end up happening to the government, to the monarchy? Plus, that he just doesn't want to be told what to do because he is the king of France and he's answerable only to God, not the peasants. It's another thing about this whole thing is that the whole thing about the French Revolution is Louis the Sixteenth is so disconnected from his own people. He doesn't realize how bad problems really are. There are people starving in the streets of Paris. He doesn't understand that. I guess that it came, always came so easy for him. Yeah, everything's always easy. Everything handed to him. So you got to feel that's how it is for everybody. Yeah. Why is it like that for everybody? He's just 
every meal he has, every snack, it makes your Thanksgiving dinner look like a pop tart. <laughs> And they throw out enough food a day to create a French village for a year. So why didn't he? I mean, so why didn't he understand? Yeah, I mean, if he didn't, go, why did he just like didn't go out and they didn't go out and see? Yeah, they go out and see, but they just go those nice little do. things. And of course, a world visit. Of course, you put on all, you pull out all the stops. Oh, you say okay. hello to the king, uh, bowing, getting gifts to him, and. Uh, Everybody's all happy and wonderful. They're not seeing bad things. They're not seeing yeah, women delivering babies in the gutters. Right. They're not seeing children, bodies of children wind up in the alleys. <laughs> they don't see eight-year-old little girls having to prostitute themselves so the family will have food that night. Mm -hmm. That's the life for the French peasants. 1789. Yeah, the Assembly of Notables. Yeah, Assembly of Notables. Yeah, they're saying all these things. Yeah, he was like 20 years old when he came to the throne. He's still in his 20s. He came by Pretty much. Actually, his hobbies are picking locks. Something to do, learn how to pick a lock. We had no communication whatsoever with him, with the parents, Yeah, no communication with him at all. That's Except to be born. I mean, I mean, he gets to eat and all that. Maybe oh, he, gets so he gets to eat, drink, he gets to travel, he gets to, oh, he, does? he gets to invite to the celebrities of the day to the palace. He's here at okay. Versailles. He's 20 miles outside of Paris. This huge estate. Okay, so he just don't sit there in his little estate for. And he's not just sitting there all the time, but could have been one or two, but he's got basically this beautiful home. I mean, it's like, it can take you days just to go through every room in the palace. You've got uh, everything you ever want. You've got running water at Versailles. You've got... Uh, the people have to use the same bathroom. Yeah. They don't even have bathtubs, no. a lot of them. Oh, they have one per village. Yeah, that's what I Maybe like that. The one per... Oh, my God. <laughs> and he's this far disconnected from them. So he's basically living like a god. Pretty much. As the power of God. He's living like God. And doesn't understand how people are living. Because what's going to happen if he stop... If, uh, it's going to happen otherwise. He uh, does anything change it. He's still king. So it's the same lifestyle. Just understand how he like have all his food and his lavish life. Because he's the king and he can basically call the shots. Right. Well, and this one, because he's so important, they want to give all this stuff to him too. Not want to help like. Yeah. And of course, there would be occasional charities here and there, but they're just dropping the bucket. Sometimes there are famines, and the French or royal family will donate the grain to the villages to uh, feed the people, but he wants repayment for that. Was it during the time period when there was a meeting where I could charity with it? That was charity in France at the time? There were charities, but uh, not a lot. And uh, even in times of famine, this isn't taking, place, this isn't taking account of the regular times. People are in such deep poverty. Right. So, question. Mm -hmm. so, even if people wanted to do something, they couldn't say that about the way you, you know. Like the king's way. power is absolute. Yeah. You're stuck with him no matter what. Oh, whoa. Um, and the king is incompetent, <laughs> uncaring. He simply just doesn't understand what's going on. And really doesn't care. He doesn't have what motivation does he have to care what's going on? Right. Nothing. Yeah. Same way it's been for generations. Except Thomas Jefferson was ambassador to France. He saw the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, saw the increasing levels of poverty in Paris. Sickened by it. why he's pushed so much for the other right, say, for the Americans to have farms. All Americans need to have farms, Jefferson. If not fathom the idea of Americans living in that kind of depth of poverty. So what would it be like compared to like say uh, 
really poor country in Africa, like say Ethiopia. So I don't know if Ethiopia is poor, but I mean, actually, it's not. Not. Except, well, I mean, just, <laughs> it's past all of those famous, but to say, like some. Like say, it's like uh, this. You have the say the one percent in France. They have everything, and then you have the bottom. They have, uh, but most of the people that ninety percent of the people in France, they're just barely getting by. Just barely getting by. Like I say, this con the structure will be like it is a lot of developing country. You have these. Very few people who are very wealthy have everything they could ever want. No middle class, but everybody else is poor. That's how they're trying. That's how the United you know, States is supposedly going too. Yeah, 20th century, we had a huge middle class, but it's it's struggling with this. The middle class basically built this country in the 20th century with a few wealthy, but the majority are middle class. They have enough enough everything, but they're very few poor. But Problems in the economy change today, but we'll discuss this more as we uh, move on. Hebrew right. Books, chapter 19. Talk about more on the next time.